Okay, this is an interview with James Lewis Matcha, July the 7th, 2002. And he's going to tell us about his naval experience. Well, where would you uh, like me to start? Uh, at the very beginning, uh, or when World War II broke out, uh, uh, it really all started, I reckon, when uh, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. And uh, it was Monday, of course, before I knew it because the news wasn't as, as uh, far flung, you might say, as it is nowadays uh, when something happens. So it was Monday when I went to school. At the time I was 15 years old. It was December the 7th, 1941. And uh, of course I knew what I wanted to go into, but I wasn't old enough at the time. But I had always wanted the uh, Navy. And also I was interested in the medical field. Uh, so I was able to get a rating before I went in because of experience that I had had in first aid and so on. But I was going to have to wait until I was almost 18 before I could go in. It took over a year to, to convince my dad to sign my papers so that I could get in at uh, 17 years, but if I had reached 18, I would have been drafted, and I sure didn't want that because I wanted to choose what I had, so I visited the recruiting office. I probably was pissed with him and uh, learned all about the Navy that I could from the recruiter. and. Then uh, about uh, February of 1943, I convinced my dad to go ahead and sign my papers so I could go into the Navy. And uh, so I signed up with se several more in my classroom, there were about four of us who signed up at the same time. And I was the only one that uh, went to Great Lakes Naval Training Station uh, in, uh, at near Chicago. Um, I never had uh, traveled around much uh, before, not very far from home, because transportation in the rural areas of Alabama had not been developed to any degree, so it was the first time for me to travel all the way by train to Chicago, all alone, switch trains two or three times. So somebody must have been looking after me up there to help me finally arrive at the gate at uh, Great Lakes Naval Training Station. It was here that I first became acquainted with my company to be during boot camp. There were about 150, and of this 150, I was the only one south of the Mason-Dixon line, and I had a little time understanding that foreign language that they were speaking. But uh, in about two weeks, I began to understand uh, their jabbering. And training was uh, quite an experience. Everything was new to me. It was the first time I'd been away from home. But uh, 
in my talks with Dad trying to get him to sign my papers, I had told him that I wouldn't be wanting to come home or homesick, and if, if I'd have gotten homesick, I wouldn't have let nobody know uh, because I said I wouldn't. But I spent six weeks in uh, boot camp learning to drill and all. Uh, but uh, they must have been a bunch of dumb people because they couldn't keep in step. I was the only one in the whole bunch who could keep in step. The rest of them was out of step. And he used, the drill instructor used to walk along beside me trying to teach me to count. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. I was pretty dumb in those days. <laughs> but uh, we learned about how to handle a rifle. Uh, we had to stand watch duty. They gave us a rifle that wouldn't fire and we had to spend four hours standing down guarding the boiler. Uh, if uh, we'd have had an infiltrator on the base, uh, I reckon you had to club him to de death with a gun stock. <laughs> but uh, we got through with five weeks. Last week was uh, work, what they call work week. You had a project that you had to do. Uh, the trimming on the, near the sidewalk was uh, grass, but we dug up the, that grass, went across the street or road, and got sod and brought it over and set out where we had already dug up the, the grass that was there. So what the logic was of putting grass where grass was, I don't know, but just to uh, get you to work and beautify the place up I reckon and each day we had to steel wool down the floors of the barracks so we're playing wooden floors so you get a pad of steel wool and place it under both feet and go sliding down the, the boards until you got every mark off of them and to keep from uh, marking the floors up, we had what was called shoeses or something that you pulled over your shoes to keep the shoes from uh, scuffing up or marking the floor, but you still sandpapered them every day. You had all of the cleaning details that you had to go through and all of that stuff, which uh, was supposed to be changing us into a sailor. So at the end of a six weeks boot camp, we got about 15 days home. And uh, that was the only time that I got home until the war was over. Uh, but I got home figuring out them impressing with that new language I done learned while I was up there in boot camp. And, um, but I spent my time visiting around and then went back and was in the OGU outgoing unit. That was where we waited until uh, we got orders cut, sending us where we were supposed to go. In about uh, two weeks, uh, we were loaded on a train, a whole train load of uh, sailors heading for California. And it wasn't a gold rush. Uh, we uh, arrived in California. I, w I went to uh, Hospital Corps Training School. We had another six weeks crash course. We covered as much in six weeks as uh, most nursing schools cover in two years. Uh, we had very few textbooks, didn't have enough to go around, and I didn't have one. So uh, naturally my score wasn't as high as some. The ones who had the highest score got to choose where they 
they went, which I, I'm glad I didn't because I liked where I finally ended up. So I went to Amphibious Training School at Oceanside, California. There we learned how to uh, board uh, landing craft and how to land on the beach. We would uh, get aboard the landing craft, go out to sea ways, and then come back into uh, shore and they'd let the ramps down. We would come off the ramps onto the beach and sometimes we would have uh, more or less a live demonstration. Explosives would be set up on the beach and they'd go off as we came on the beach. Uh, the Marine Corps airplanes would come in to strafe the beach, not with live ammunition of course, but to get us used to what we were about to go through later on. Um, after that, I, was, I went to the hospital, hospital in the Marine Corps camp at Camp Pendleton, California. I worked in the hospital there for about a month. And uh, then I was shipped up to, I shipped down to uh, San Diego to uh, meet up with the main uh, ship. Uh, the sh ship and its crew was being brought together from the beginning. The ship's keel was laid in uh, 1943 and uh, in, uh, I believe, in June of 1943. And they finished it in uh, 1943 in October, three months, and no ship of this size had ever ever been completed in that short of time. It was because of the war effort, I suppose, and everybody driving to get an armed service built up that could uh, win the war. So when uh, they had us ready to go, the ship came to San Diego and uh, we went, as I said before, we went down and went aboard. It was a new, brand new ship and uh, we got to break it in. Uh, from there, we uh, had some more training on the beaches of uh, Coronado, an island off the uh, coast of California. And from there, we went to Hawaii, and of course I'd always heard about Hawaii and I wanted to see it and the, about two days out we began to hear Hawaiian music on the uh, ship's radio and the uh, first sight we saw was Diamond Head of course and then we went into uh, Pearl Harbor and uh, dropped anchor and we had a few days that we could uh, go into Honolulu and uh, walk around. I thought it was rather odd that I came to where there was pineapple ju juice and I drank orange juice. And uh, then l later on, uh, when I got to another island, I, I drank uh, pineapple juice. but. Uh, that was a wonderful smell. The Dole Pineapple Packing Company was nearby and you could smell that pineapple cooking. The uh, hulls of the ships that were destroyed on uh, the 1st of uh, uh, December the 7th, December the 7th and 41. Many of them had been removed but uh, some of them were still visible and there was not too much of a sign of it ever having been attacked 
but we took on some Air Force personnel who was being sent in as a reinforcement some, somewhere in the Pacific. And the islands, I do not know, I can't remember offhand in what uh, sequence we went to them, but there were such islands as the Solomons, uh, the Marshalls, the Marianas, there was Guadalcanal, Canal, uh, uh, Ulithi, and I, and more will come to me, but I don't remember in what order. I remember once being anchored in the uh, Marianas, and the islands were so small I didn't even see any islands, but we were anchored off of the, the, the what was supposed to be the islands. And so I remember the water being so clear, about 15 or 20 feet deep, and you could see the bottom of the ocean from there. But uh, we uh, unloaded the supplies that we were supposed to on uh, the island we were carrying them to, and uh, went to a couple of other ones to uh, unload supplies. We were a transport as well as an assault transport, and uh, then we had to go back to the States. But one thing happened as we were coming out of Hawaii heading for the South Pacific. Uh, we ha had a destroyer escort, which is a DE, a small vessel. Uh, we were to be met by a cruiser further out in the ocean, but the Little DC couldn't uh, keep up with us. We were running a zigzag course, so somewhere along some wee hour of the morning, he zigged when we zagged, and uh, he ran into the side of us. And I was sleeping below the water line, and uh, all that lamb banging and all going on above my head, I didn't know whether we'd been torpedoed or not. So I got out from that place, and it was mostly the garbage cans in the galley above uh, banging around, but uh, it didn't knock a hole in the side of our ship, but it tore up the bow of that little DE. And of course we made it okay without having any repairs to be made, the DE returned, and so we went on by ourselves and hope, hoping that no uh, Japanese submarine was anywhere along the uh, way uh, watching us. From uh, the islands we went back to the States. Uh, we went to Washington. Uh, we had to have some repairs. We went to, to Seattle and then uh, to Lake Washington where there was a shipyard. We had to have a new screw put on because the one we had had an 18 inch crack in it. It was the main reason that we had to come back to the States. If it hadn't been for this crack we would have stayed in uh, the Pacific for an invasion. But uh, we got the crack fixed, and we went up. To, let's see, no, we went down the coast to San Francisco and picked up uh, army troops, and uh, as 1,800 of them, they had never been to sea, and that was the most mess we ever had. Was those seasick people filling up all of the uh, garbage cans, leaning over the rails. Uh, but uh, we got them, put them off on some island in the Pacific. And then uh, while this was all going on, uh, Iwo Jima was being invaded. 
And had it not been for having to go back to the States, we would have probably been in on the invasion of Iwo Jima, which was fortunate for me because nine out of ten of the beach parties, which we will call, were wiped out on the beaches of Iwo. But we were in training on the beaches of Guadalcanal and several other little islands uh, while they were finishing up on uh, Iwo Jima. We were, we were preparing for the invasion of Okinawa. Of course, we didn't know it. Uh, people back home knew more about what was going on in the war than we did. We only knew what was uh, going on right around us. So we uh, finished our training and then we went to uh, some island, I believe it may have been in the Philippines, and picked up the 1st Marine Division, which had uh, been uh, fighting on Iwo Jima, and uh, were getting ready to carry them to Okinawa. Well, uh, we made a lot of stops at different places. I can't remember all of them offhand. I'd have to refer back to other information on that. But uh, it was Easter Sunday. I remember Easter Sunday because I thought, well, they're dropping eggs on uh, Okinawa. That was before the invasion. We couldn't see it, but a day before, the battleships and all, and the planes were bombing the beaches of uh, Okinawa. Uh, this would have been my first invasion, but uh, I didn't know what to expect. And on the board ship, uh, while we were on maneuvers, I was going off and we uh, were fixing to go over the rail. I had on a backpack and all of that and my fatigue, green fatigues and field shoes. And one of the Marines came up and tapped me on the back and he had noticed my name on my backpack and he happened to be a boy that I went to school with. And so we made it a point to get together when I got back and uh, we had movies and uh, they didn't, so I loaned him a pair of blue jeans and a blue shirt and a cap so he could go anywhere he wanted to and attend the movies as, as a sailor. Before we invade Okinawa, I will give a little more detail on, i uh, say, the invasion of Iwo Jima. It was a... Was, an invasion where nine out of ten of the beach parties, which I was a member, of, were wiped out. But fortunately, we had to go back and get a screw for the ship. But uh, the casualties were very high. Iwo Jima is only about a mile square, and it took four days to take it. In the four days, there was around 5,700 uh, casualties uh, counted. The taking of the Mount Sarabachi, where the flag was, the picture of the flag raising took place, was a volcanic island covered with dust. Uh, some of the people there who were there described it as a moonscape that was so barren and they had to dig the Japanese out practically. It was inch by inch and it was tongued between the fortifications where they could uh, leave 
one pill box and go to another and while the Marines might pass one pill box and then they would come up behind them through a tunnel from another and they would have to retake that. So it finally ended up that they were having to use flamethrowers and when the CBs got bulldozers in they were able to bulldoze sand up around a lot of those pill boxes since the Japanese wouldn't surrender and come out and use flamethrowers or drop explosives down the vents of them. And if my memory is right, the Japanese were supposed to fight to the death, and which they did, I think it was less than 3,000 Japanese that became prisoners of war. Uh, and I would imagine that most of those were wounded because uh, none of them surrendered otherwise. And uh, uh, one, one thing I forgot was the crossing of the equator. Of course, the crossing of the equator is a very uh, special o occasion for sailors. Before they cross the equator, they're known as a polywog. And after they cross the equator, they are known as a shellback. So you have a initiation ceremony that takes place. Now the Navy does not condone the initiation. So on the day of the initiation, the captain would uh, stay in his quarters all day and not know anything about it. Uh, but they started the day before with uh, Davy Jones coming aboard and uh, I don't know, remember what sailor was playing the role of Davy Jones, but Davy Jones' uh, object was to pass out orders to appear before King Neptune for trying to cross the equator without being a shell back. So uh, the next day the initiation started out we were stripped down except to our skivvies and the first thing was a line that we had to crawl through it, uh, and they had wet us down with fire hoses and then uh, they had pieces of fire hoses that they swatted us on the behind with. Of course they didn't hit us hard. It was near as bad as some belt lines I had been through as a, a kid in initiations. But uh, then you appeared before Neptune. Uh, he was dressed up in his regal outfit and uh, he pronounced judgment on you for whatever charges were against you. Uh, I think mine may have been trying to woo the ro royal maidens or something like that, but uh, I was found guilty so I had to go through the punishment. The first thing I went to was the royal barber, and the royal barber took a pair of clippers, he started at the front of your head and with the clippers held next to the scalp he cut a row as wide as the clippers. Uh, down the front and down the back. Then it started at one ear and went across to the other ear with the uh, clippers cutting out. Then after we had uh, our hair cut, we had to uh, go through what was called kissing the baby. We had this fat Mexican cook who uh, had his st stomach greased with uh, grease and hair and you had to bend down and kiss his stomach. And so no one wanted to but uh, one uh, had you by one arm and one by the other. And so somebody behind you 
took something like a cattle prod and touched those wet shorts and you, <laughs> that poor guy, cook is the one that got the worst end of that all day. Then you had to go to the royal surgeons and you were put up on, on this table and they poured some foul tasting concoction in your mouth. I don't know what was in it, but you could hardly keep it there. And you were supposed to swallow that medicine. Well, nobody in his right mind going to swallow something that tastes that bad. So the surgeon has a knife, and that knife is charged, and he lays it on your stomach. And when you, that charge hits your stomach, you swallow. And uh, I, there was another thing that we had to go through, but the last thing was the royal bath. They had this grease slide that uh, in a pool made out of canvas on the ship's deck and you had to slide head first down the ramp into the seawater in the pool and when you came out the other side you were an official shell back. But to get back to uh, Okinawa the invasion of Okinawa to something a little more serious. Uh, they had bombed and shelled Okinawa beaches all day and all night. And uh, then the transports came in the next morning and we went in closer to the beach and the troops were loaded onto the landing craft and uh, started circling. We were always to go in on the second wave, but uh, the medical section of our group was in reserve and we're not, unless the casualties got so high on the beaches, we did not have to go in. So we were aboard ship instead of hitting the beaches with the troops in the second wave. And uh, when the troops got to the beaches, they just walked to shore. There was no resistance whatsoever. And they began to think, were they going to take the island without any resistance? But uh, the, the next day or the day thereafter, they began to run into resistance. And the Japanese started sending in the, their kamikazes. Uh, kamikaze is a word that means divine wind. Uh, they would come in about four o'clock every afternoon. They were loaded with bombs and there were planes of no return. Their object was to sink as many ships as they could and they would, there would be hundreds of them coming in. And sometimes the gunners could shoot them, would be able to shoot them down. But unfortunately, there were a few that went into ships. I remember one, the uh, hospital ships are the only ships in wartime that can go fully lighted. And uh, under the Geneva Convention, they are not supposed to be attacked but a suicide plane went through the side of one into the operating room. It killed, I don't know how many doctors, and four nurses were killed who had a pa and the patient on the uh, operating table. Uh, one day during this raid, I had just gotten through the chow line. And we had ice cream, and we only had ice cream about once every four or five months. 
So I had my ice cream on my tray and no kamikaze was going to keep me from eating that ice cream. So I took my a tray uh, with the ice cream on it and carried it to my battle station with me. But uh, the transports did not get as much uh, or as many hits as the other ships of the uh, convoy, which was fortunate for us. Uh, we were the ones that were closest to shore. We were the ones who were unloading supplies. After we got the men ashore, we started unloading supplies, and we had a storm to come up. In the meantime, and the lighter or barge, whichever you wanted to call it, was tied up alongside, but the storm got so bad that it was breaking steel cables and it was holding it to the ship. And uh, you, you can imagine a flat barge going one way and a ship going another way and trying to hit that barge with a load of uh, supplies dropped on it by a crane. But uh, the, when it, a cable wouldn't hold it, they had to start using the engine to keep it alongside the ship. And we got six holes knocked in the ship at the uh, water line and of course the repair crews were able to plug up those holes before much water came aboard by taking timbers and welding a bracket on the deck and then uh, taking the timber and putting a mattress on the end of it and jamming it up against the hole in the side of the ship. But that was the extent of our damage during the whole operation. After we had unloaded, we went back and started preparing for the invasion of Japan. We had loaded up uh, troops in the Philippines that, uh, I can't think of the name of the place now, but we loaded up army troops. That's the first time we'd carried army troops into battle and uh, we were heading for Japan when we got them and supplies loaded up. Well, we were on our way in a convoy to Japan when they dropped the atomic bomb on, Iwishi, on uh, Hiroshima and uh, the other two cities in Japan. And this caused Japan to surrender. Probably if it hadn't been for the bomb being dropped, they, there would be as many Americans killed in the invasion of Japan as they were killed in the entire war because they would have had to fought Japan tooth and claw for every square inch of Japan. But the bomb brought them to their senses and uh, they surrendered. Well, we had the troops and the supplies on there, so we took them into Japan and uh, put them on the beach near I believe it was Wakayama, and uh, we spent the night ashore as we did any time we were unloading troops or supplies. We had to set up a, a battle dressing station or a first aid station to take care of the casualties or any injuries that might occur. So, and it was sort of cold at night. Uh, we had medical cots that we took, so we slept on cots uh, in our, after we dug out a place for our aid station. And uh, the wind would go in under one end of that cot and come out the next. 
but uh, the ship always sent us food, but here we were unloading food. So we decided that the food that was being unloaded was better than what the ship was sending us to eat. So a couple of three who was wise in the ways of the, the beach, when the guard on the supplies would go around to the other side, they would grab a box or two and take it back. And so we ate pretty high on the hog during the, our stay on the beach. Since the war was over and I had some of the most points of, of those on the ship, they dumped me off in uh, the Philippines and uh, left me at uh, the hospital in Cavite, a little island in Manila Bay. And I stayed there until about December. Uh, I remember spending Thanksgiving on that island. And I remember the night before I got there, I was having to stand guard duty. Corman, the uh, medic, medical section is not supposed to stand guard duty, but I was on a sign, so they put me stand guard duty and gave me a carbine. I had one of my own but I thought it had an empty clip in it. So I went in to eat chow and uh, mess uh, head, uh, I don't know whether it was sergeant or what, told me I couldn't have a clip in rifle while I was in the uh, mess hall. I said, it's not loaded. Yeah, I'll show you. And I pulled back the boat and out, bolt and out came a, cartridge. I didn't even know it was in there, <laughs> but uh, every once in a while you could still hear Japanese and Americans firing on the Philippines, uh, and it was not a very pleasant night that I spent there, but the next day, uh, so uh, th they put us on a train and unless you've ever ridden one of those narrow gauge rail trains like they have in the Philippines, you've missed an experience because uh, they're very narrow. They have wooden benches, slat benches on them, and no place to put your luggage. And just before we took off, uh, somebody with a sense of humor outside the train was singing Sentimental Journey, and it was a journey. Uh, we rode all night on that train, sitting on those hard seats, and the next day we got to Manila and then carried out to uh, Cavite, to, this, to the hospital there, and I worked at the hospital until they shipped me back to the States. And, then that was the end.